These are the ruins of a town that used to be underwater. This ghost town was flooded back in the 1930s with the construction of the Hoover Dam, which created Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the US. It forced residents of this small town to relocate. The last person to leave was in 1938. He lit his house on fire before getting in a boat and rowing away. I came out to this town to see for myself this place that was at 1.60 feet below the water. Water levels fluctuated over the years and it reappeared several times during the 20th century. But now it's been above water for nearly 20 years. And it's likely not going back underwater anytime soon. It's because water levels in Lake Mead have been dropping for years. It's filled by the Colorado River, which is a lifeline for over 40 million people in the western U.S. and Mexico. And the river, as you can see from this town, is not as abundant as it once was. You've probably heard of droughts and wildfires in California, of groundwater drying up in Arizona, and of entire communities like those in the Navajo Nation that have been left without running water. So why does it seem like the American West is running out of water? Decades of ambitious infrastructure projects coupled with using more water than nature can provide has all but accelerated water scarcity in the desert. But the future doesn't have to look as bleak as this ghost town. Let's first take a look at this map. It's what state borders in the Western United States almost look like and arguably should have. It was created by John Wesley Powell in the 1800s, a Civil War veteran and the first white man to explore the Colorado River via boat. He went on to author one of the most important reports about water in the West, published in 1878. This map by Powell is based on the water's natural flows and its watersheds. It was his answer for how best to control the rivers, irrigate arid lands, and distribute water equally among inhabitants. But instead, it was myth and blind growth that took the place of Powell's careful science. Before Powell took his trip down river, a group of Mormons who were violently outcast from other attempted settlements in the US arrived in what would become Salt Lake City, Utah. Their leader, Brigham Young, declared this dry and dusty land the place for his people to settle in July of 1847. After years of persecution, the Mormons had finally found land, which was part of Mexico at the time, where they might finally be able to practice their religion in peace. They also saw great promise in the mountain streams. Before traveling to the Salt Lake Valley, they had gone to Santa Fe and learned how communities there were already sharing water and digging ditches for irrigation. They were techniques that combined the efforts of Native Americans and Spanish settlers. The Mormons actually dammed this water source, which they named City Creek, and they dug ditches to let the water flow into the dry Salt Lake Valley. While indigenous tribes had already been irrigating land like this for thousands of years, it was the Mormon success that laid the groundwork for other settlers who would soon come to this area. The Mormons' arrival set in motion just one piece of the dark history of colonization in the United States. Enslaving black people and the indentured servitude of indigenous people was legal in Utah's early days. And these practices were supported by Brigham Young. And so the desert and its water would never be the same. First, it was the discovery of gold in California. Then it was the Homestead Act, which gave Americans the right to claim land for cultivation. It was also the era of rapid railroad expansion, which connected the West to the rest of the country. But it was also in the late 19th century that the region saw a period of unusually large amounts of rainfall. It gave life to the myth that rain follows the plow. The population in the West of non-native people boomed throughout the rest of the century. Water was divided up and diverted, and meanwhile, John Wesley Powell was arguing for the science to be heard. His watershed states were ultimately rejected. State lines were drawn, and soon, dams would be built. Dams were in part made possible by the signing of the Reclamation Act, which aimed to irrigate the land and conserve water. It was signed in 1902 by President Theodore Roosevelt, and it created what we now know as the Bureau of Reclamation. It is the reason the modern West exists as it does today. 
In the 1920s, it came time to allocate water in the Colorado River, equally between states in the Colorado River Basin. Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. Creating a compact between these states would prevent future controversies over its water, and it would also aid in the future agricultural and industrial development of the region. Eugene LaRue, a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, challenged Congress during a hearing. It's a little-known fact that was discovered by John Fleck. Explicitly, no question, LaRue, the nation's leading scientist on this issue, says there is not enough water, and they just ignored it. The nation went ahead with its plans. Governance of the river has evolved over time with new agreements and compacts added, collectively called the Law of the River. These projects were able to bring life in the masses to the U.S. and are responsible for creating so many of our Western communities. But there are people who don't have access to the water anymore. Today, the Colorado River's water is split between seven Western states and part of Mexico. It's a complicated source of water that's been heavily managed over the years, and it weaves from the Rocky Mountains, through the Grand Canyon, and into Mexico. Yet it rarely flows all the way to the sea like it once did. This is where the river has dried up in Mexico. Dam building may have slowed in the 1970s in favor of environmental interests and cheaper options. And today, we know that these solutions are just no longer repeatable as the West now faces an emerging mega drought, which has the potential to eclipse the worst drought on record from 1,200 years ago. All these infrastructure systems that we built was built on the assumption that climatic patterns are gonna repeat themselves, not because of climate change, we are seeing a shift in the way water cycle happens. And also another piece is, I think, this disconnect that we have between people and their water. We created this complex infrastructure system. We brought water to people. So we kind of brought this sense of abundance. Today, these decisions of the past have been manifested by droughts in California, which also led to wildfires, and to over a million people without access to clean drinking water. 30% of the Navajo Nation does not have access to clean water, which has only been more devastating during the COVID-19 pandemic. Parts of Arizona have seen precious groundwater drained by the billions of gallons, severely affecting residents and farmers. We are finally coming to terms with years of water policy that has been mainly directed by two principles, a first come, first serve mentality and a use it or lose it doctrine. Neither has inspired conservation. You have a culture around water that says when you have a drought, you share the water that's available. Whereas Western water law says that those who have higher priority get all of their water in a time of drought before others get any. There has also been a destructive impact on freshwater habitats. Fish and bird populations have been declining for years in the Colorado River Basin. All the while, people keep moving westward. Today, the American West is home to five of the top 15 fastest growing large cities in the U.S. But there is something happening in a lot of these cities that is really quite remarkable. I kept looking for the running out of water catastrophe. And what I found instead of running out of water is people realizing, they kind of looking around go, oh my gosh, our water supply is running short. We need to use less of it. And then they're super successful in doing that. Water use is going down even as population goes up. It's a surprising trend found in places like Las Vegas, Albuquerque, and Phoenix. The grand projects of the 20th century may be mostly over, but they have given way to smaller, more sustainable solutions that aim to conserve existing water. A lot of that is thanks to legislation that was passed nationally in the early 1990s that said every toilet, every faucet, every shower head has to meet certain standards of efficiency. That has been building conservation into our homes and offices for you know nearly 30 years. There are other creative solutions like using recycled wastewater or non-drinkable water to irrigate things like golf courses and public parks. Cities are also beginning to implement something called green infrastructure, which involves creating more natural spaces to catch rainfall rather than just letting it go down a storm drain. Green infrastructure looks as simple as this garden at the University of Utah. It doubles as a supportive habitat for an array of wildlife like bumblebees and hummingbirds. 
Research has also shown that people will reduce their own personal water use when they're aware of the droughts that could affect them. We can get by with a lot less water. And that's what we have to do, is just realize we can do that. And then with that realization, I'm optimistic that we can do this stuff. Despite this positive and surprising turn, we are still using more water than our established systems can provide. New proposals like the Lake Powell Pipeline in Southern Utah demonstrate just that. The project proposes moving millions of gallons of water from Lake Powell, a reservoir on the Colorado River, about 140 miles to the growing metropolitan area in that region. How do we get smarter about how we use water? How do we reduce our water use rather than constantly looking for more? Because there's not gonna be more. And we do know that. The supply is going to diminish. And so our demands have to diminish. Water gives life to millions of people in the West, but it also has a complicated history that left out a lot of people. And now we're faced with the effects of this as well as with climate change. As Mark Reisner wrote in Cadillac Desert, one does not really conquer a place like this. One inhabits it like an occupying army and makes, at best, an uneasy truce with it. This century, with ghost towns emerging from the depths, will change what the West looks like. But now is as good a time as any to make a truce with the natural flow of the rivers and create a more equitable future for water in the West. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to know more about water in the West, make sure you check out the links below. It's a really complex topic, and there's no way I could have covered it all in one video. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.